This audio contains mention of alleged sexual assault. Welcome back to Hidden Cases, and thank you for tuning in to episode two. Last week, we heard from Subject 1A and their experience at the We Spa protest on July 17th. In this episode, we will hear from Subject 2A, who attended the same event. If this is your first time listening, please go back and listen to the introduction trailer. It may give you better context on the following interview. Episode 2, Subject 2A, Protest Community. Their voice has been altered to conceal their identity. I feel emotional and scared about talking about it. I feel very safe with you. And I'm like, the fact that you took this on, I feel safest with you. I'm so happy that you did this. Personally, I'm like, am I going to be triggered by something I say? Am I going to say too much? Am I going to say too little? Am I going to not be emotional? Am I going to be too emotional? It's like this whole thing. It's just hard to process and then talk about it. So uh, I had been at the first We Spa protest. Um, and then the second one popped up and it was like, of course, I'm going to go there. I'm going to hold it down. We knew that LAPD was probably going to be more aggressive and violent this time. They always escalate. And then we were even more more worried about the white supremacists this time because there had been threats of them shooting us and stabbing people again. They had stabbed a comrade um, on the 3rd for the first We Spa protest. On July 3rd, the first protest at We Spa, there were several fights between the right and the left. There were two stabbings committed by the same individual who was demonstrating with the quote, anti pedo protest, as advertised on flyers. The first stabbing victim was a counter-protester advocating for trans rights. The second stabbing victim was a right-wing protester, allegedly hit by mistake while removing the assailant from a brawl. Filmmaker Rocky Romano compiled footage of the stabbing incident and squashed false reports that Antifa had committed the stabbing. Romano was also attacked that day. He was struck in the back of the head with a pipe from a right-wing extremist. That day, he had press written across his back and thankfully was also wearing a helmet. Reports of a bat, mace, large rosary beads, a water bottle, a pipe, and a knife used by the right in altercations have been confirmed. It like it gets more, it's ridiculous. It's so insane and violent that it turns into something that's ridiculous because you can't believe that it's just happening right in front of your eyes in this city that is so like supposed to be progressive and accepting it's the safe haven for like the weirdos right the people that aren't expe- aren't accepted at home you come out to los angeles you're free right allegedly yep it's <laughs> the exact opposite um so i had gone there to to the we spa protest to cover and film and photograph as i do and I uh, usually get like pretty close to the police lines and sometimes I watch back on like my footage or like photos I'm like why (laughs) why are you so close (laughs) because it doesn't feel as dangerous when you're in the moment it feels like your only option is to be up close and fighting for the thing that you're there to fight for if that makes sense And so I was shoved by one of the cops when I was filming. And then during that time, it's just like it was one after another. So a journalist and comrades were beaten. Then like a minute later, I was shoved. And then a minute later from that, another comrade was shot. I can't remember. Was she confirmed shot in the face or shot in the chest? It was point blank. First major projectile shooting. And so then that happened and it just, it never calmed down from that moment. And then they ended up pushing us back, pushing us down the street, shooting projectiles, just like at, like LAPD was just shooting people as they were running. Like there's no way, they can't even aim when they're standing still, let alone aim correctly and not even, like you can't even aim correctly. Like they're supposed to be aimed at the ground and nobody there even did anything to get shot. Like they shouldn't have the projectiles in the first place anyway. (laughs) Um, And then they pushed us. They kept trying to kettle us and we just kept like outsmarting them. And we were also dispersing. And then they finally kettled us when we were on the sidewalk. It was, I think it was about noon 
that I think it was about an hour from when the anti-trans protesters arrived to when we were kettled. I think it was about an hour. And then they basically brought us off of the sidewalk. We were like, there was me and then a few other comrades who were filming that were in the street. Everybody else was on the sidewalk. And then basically, and I have footage of it, they go push them off the sidewalk, get them into the street, get them into the street. And then they pushed us into the street and then arrested us for being in the street, for not dispersing. Alfonso Lopez, who is the captain of the Rampart Division, gave them the order to push us off of the sidewalk. It felt very tunnel-like. I keep accidentally calling it the tunnel. I'll just be casually talking about it. I'll be like, oh, the tunnel. I'm like, oh, no, different thing. But it felt like something where they were pushing one line of cops, was telling us to disperse and pushing us into another line of cops that was behind us, then telling us that we're not dispersing (laughs) and that we're in the street, even though we're on the sidewalk. And then they started arresting people. And then they basically created a circle around us. It felt very like like a dogfight or like we're caged animals or something. They just created a circle around us. And then they ended up like pushing press out of the area so that you guys couldn't see us as well and made it difficult for anyone to see what actually was happening within the kettle. But then I was staying live as long as I could because I'm like, there's no... No one is seeing this. No one, no one else is going to see what happens in this kettle. Like I have to go live yeah. and film this because I also didn't know what was going to happen in the kettle. I mean, they were pointing projectiles at us when we literally had nowhere, nowhere to go. We were just standing there. What I keep thinking of with this entire scenario, as we always say, how many weren't filmed? How many moments aren't filmed? How many don't get national news? How many people are brutalized and murdered and sexually assaulted? How many people are sexually assaulted and don't even know that they're sexually assaulted because that's how they think it's supposed to be conducted? They don't want the world to know. And even now the world knows and they're still not doing anything. So it was very calm. Like I look back at it and it was, we were all very calm. We were, because you can't do anything at that point. What are you going to do? Run away? But can I cuss? Yes. <laughs> yeah, oh my okay. God. <laughs> you are fucked at that point. You look around and you're like, that's it. Like I'm getting arrested. And it was also my first time getting arrested. But they just, so they started taking people one by one. They said, next person up on their little loudspeaker thing. And then we would walk backwards towards them, but with our back to them and our hands up. And then... It was so nice how comrades would chant, like, we, we love you Mm -hmm. as someone was getting arrested. Or the comrade would chant, like, all cops are bastards or something like that. (laughs) And then everybody, that's what I did. I chanted ACAB as I was getting arrested. And then I just heard, like, (laughs) my, like, seven comrades in this teeny tiny little cop bubble just being like all cops are bastards <laughs> and I just screamed that all the way until they started processing me I mean they were a aggr- I feel like they were aggressive in their arrests they didn't like beat people or they didn't shoot us they did point at us and point blank with the projectiles but I remember them being like aggressive in a small manner like I would see as they sort of grab them and walk away, maybe they would move their body in a way that it shouldn't be moved or just like being aggressive in a very small, in a small way so that people again, couldn't see. And then eventually it was my turn. I think there were like seven people left after me and I was trying to stay as long as I could. But in that moment I like panicked because Mm -hmm. they were silent and I'm like now, okay, my turn and I'll go. So I went uh, and I was chanting a cab, which <laughs> felt great. But also, like, I had and I still have, like, nerve damage in my hand. They, they like, did my, um, what do they call them? Not cuffs. Um, zip, zip ties. Tight. Too tight. And I think it was because I was screaming a cab. Um, and so then they brought us, we were sort of all 
it was very weird because we were all just seemed very casual for a second because we each had a cop with us and then they were just processing us. And it felt very weird because we were just talking to each other in this very dramatic situation, right? So we're just like, do you have any weapons on you? Nope. Are you in a gang? No. Nope. You know, it just felt very calm for a second. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you would start hearing things around you about um, maybe a cop was starting to be a little bit more aggressive. Um, and also I had a, this is like, is it okay if I talk about something other than the <laughs> assault? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I had my camera with me, right? And I was so worried that my camera was going to be broken because when they see a camera, that's a weapon to LAPD. That's a weapon. And at night, even when I pull out my camera, I'm like, are they going to think that this is legitimately a weapon and try and say it is? So I had my bag there and the cop was like being quote nice, right? Being cordial. Right. And I'm like, you're a pig is a pig, <laughs> even if you're talking in a calm voice. <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to try and put this camera in here so it doesn't get broken or whatever. I was like, okay. And he was putting it in there. And then I kept being like, all you have to do is move that little piece right there and it'll fit. Like, what are you doing? Do you not know how to fit this in? (laughs) So I was giving him some crap. And then right when he got my camera into the bag and he zipped it up, started getting a little mouthy with him, right? And he immediately was like, I could have left your camera out so it would have gotten broken. I could have done this so this would have gotten broken. It was a thing of like, he wanted me to pat him on the back for doing... I don't, don't even think it's the minimum. I think it's just not, it's like breaking even. Like you shouldn't break our stuff. Um, and then I said, okay, now I'm done talking. He was like, okay, good. Um, and that moment stuck out to me because they also never read us our rights at any point, which I believe that they're supposed to do it right as they're arresting you. Um, so that was sort of, it sat with me wrong, you know? Um, and then after that moment, I saw like a comrade on the side and I was like, okay, I, I didn't feel as scared about getting arrested. Right. Cause you're, you're always worried about that moment. What is it going to be like? Um, and then I heard yelling and I had realized that a, a comrade had been sexually assaulted. I don't know why I'm, I feel like I'm getting emotional at this point. The thing about knowing what might happen before it happens feels really fucked up. I kept hearing about, okay, my comrade has been sexually assaulted and is demanding someone to talk to. Meanwhile, all of these people are just standing around. All of these cops are just standing around and she's just, everyone just yelling into just, it's just like white noise, right? And so they're trying to, demand someone to speak to about the sexual assault, right? And another comrade who's on like a, um, I can see her, she's on like a corner of like this arrest bus because we're all sort of like against vehicles. And she is like, demand, or did you demand a female officer? And I realized I was like, I didn't because I had also been sexually assaulted in the tunnel during pat downs. So in my head, I realized, I'm like, what is she? I don't feel more safe with a female officer. She's going to do it just like that other female officer did it to a group of us. And then so she comes up and she starts doing the pat down. And the thing that sticks with me so much about this woman is that people were yelling sexual assault and assault her at her, right? You are you just sexually assaulted someone. She walked around like it was nothing. She walked around unaffected by it. And in my head, if someone's yelling at me, right? You just sexually assaulted someone. And if in my head I go, that's what? I, I didn't, okay, let, okay, let's try and explain how this process is done or whatever. I try and get into my head and go, maybe this person isn't actually people aren't as evil as this, right? But they are, and especially cops. That's why they get into the job because they want to take advantage of people. But she was just walking around so casually. And then she comes up to me and she starts to do the pat the pat down. The thing about 
this entire protest is that there's about 20 minutes that I don't remember. There's the part when we were running down the, the street with, or maybe not, maybe like 15 minutes. When we were running down the street, when they were shooting projectiles, I don't remember where I was. Like, I don't, I could not tell you where I was in that moment. What I did, where I was running, if I was running, if I, if I was in the corner, I could not tell you. And then with this, I can, with the top half of the pat down, I can only remember my, like my, what I did with my face and what I did with my body. And then I remember the bottom, the bottom half. But it's like I disassociated from myself. So when she did the top half, I remember my face was like, you know, when you're getting like a tattoo or you get like a like a twinge of pain or something, and then your face sort of like scrunches and moves, just like that. And then my body just sort of like having to brace down with my body. And that's not how you're supposed to have a like you. Sh- it's a pat down. You shouldn't be jerking around. You shouldn't be having to plant your body so it doesn't move by because the person who's patting down is using too much aggression. And then it got to the bottom half of the pat down and my legs were spread and she was like, spread your legs. And I'm like, okay, I'm gonna, uh, now it's excessive. I'm spreading my legs even more, which felt weird. Um, and she basically, she, It felt like she used the palm of her hand, which they're supposed to use the back of their hand. And it was just, feels weird because I don't want to be graphic, but I feel like I need to say it, right? It felt like a swipe down the middle, right? It felt like it wasn't a pad. It wasn't down the sides of the legs. It wasn't anywhere where I would legitimately be storing And hiding something. Do you know, you know, like it's not strip. I don't have anything strapped to my leg. I don't have anything like hidden anywhere. Right. And she just takes her hand and she just glides down the center of my vagina. And I knew right after that, I was like, that didn't feel right. And then in my head, I keep going uh, and I still have trouble with this. I go, I didn't see the hand. I didn't see if it was. Maybe I wasn't, I didn't see it. I didn't see it face up, but it felt wrong and it didn't feel, it felt invasive. Um, And then she basically, like, I don't, I don't remember what happened after that moment. Like she just walked away. We were brought over to be put into the van. And that's when the comrade who was sexually assaulted before me, I, I don't know what she was in the lineup, but that was the one that prompted me to go, okay, this woman's going around sexually assaulting comrades and protesters. I have to be prepared for what's going to happen. So she's continuing to demand someone to speak to. So I get on board with this, right? I'm like, where's this person walking around sexually assaulting people? I'm not getting into this van without my comrade and I'm not getting into this van without talking to someone because I'm going to support my comrade right there. And they don't do anything. This woman continues to walk around patting people down and the cops basically go, we'll get to it later. We'll get you someone later. Get in the van. We'll talk to someone later. Calm. The, The cops were calm about it. And it's so uncomfortable to literally see a crowd full of people didn't say no to sexual assault when at that point, I think we had thought that like four people had been sexually assaulted. We didn't really know yet, but how do you hear sexual assault and don't change your demeanor in any way? Whether you lash out and get angry and yell no or yell, how can I address this situation that you just are talking about. There was no change in demeanor, nothing, nothing at all. Um, And then we we got into the van because at that point they weren't going to do anything. And then we basically just like, I remember with my comrade sitting next to me, just being like, okay, this is what they did to me. And then she sort of discussed what they did to her. And then we sort of just were like, okay, this happened. We as women grow up 
being told people aren't going to believe you. People aren't going to trust you. People aren't going to see you, see you in this moment. And then you're surrounded by people that hear sexual assault and they don't do anything. It is heartbreaking and eye-opening because I personally am someone that like, I still, I hate a lot of people and I think a lot of people are bad <laughs> and evil, but I don't, my head can't wrap around how people, how evil people can be. And I want to hold on to that because I think that means that I'm not evil. So I try and hold on to that, but it hurts every time that you're proven wrong. I think just then during the entire thing, knowing what was going to happen before it happened feels fucked up. Is she going to do it to me? Is she going to do it to the next comrade? How many times has she done it before? How many times is she going to do it again? And again, how many people don't even know that they're sexually assaulted during Pat Towns? I just know when you feel a part of a hand between, I don't, between the lips is not the correct term, <laughs> but that's what it is. Like when you feel it in between, that's the moment that you go, uh, I felt it in between the lips. Like I felt it somewhat separate and in between that's bullets. inside but i have a theory about why they're doing this i think that they're i think it's a an act of transphobia because i think that they're it's like their way of going like what genitals that's what i think it is i mean of course there's the just the power and the control and just everything that goes along with it right but it feels like that's an undertone that it's an act of transphobia and it's an act of like trying to be like let's see what let's see what genitals this person has i just wonder how many people is this a bigger issue than we think it is or ha is it being swept under the rug just as most sexual assaults are right is it just a part of it? Like, we're going to sweep this under the rug. I think that's another thing with this, is like the triggering. This, and I don't know how my, the comrades that experience this as well feel, but it triggers your entire life of situations. It triggers everything because you go, like when I put out that close friends, post i originally was like why aren't people talking about this i made a post on my instagram i said basically why aren't people talking about this why aren't people being more vocal why aren't people going after lapd and it's just like people when when nobody screams loudly about it for you you look at yourself and you go they don't they must not believe me they must not or they must think that we deserved it or something you know it's like when i made a post about like getting arrested and getting sexually assaulted. And then you see all these people that you know that you used to have dinner with and hang out with and go dancing with or whatever. And they just swipe past it and you go, it must not be as bad if people aren't caring because if it was as bad as it felt and as bad as it is on paper, people would care more and they don't. Sorry, I'm like spirally <laughs> what no. I'm talking about. I've sort of isolated myself for, which I know is not taking care of myself. Like I've had people send me messages and be supportive. But when you're on the fifth message of them sending you something, like if you need anything or if you're okay or whatever, and then you reply back going, I'm okay okay, uh, but I'm feeling down or like I'm physically okay, but like I need someone to talk to or whatever. And all they do is like it and then never reply back. You stop being able, like you don't have the threshold anymore for, okay, is this, does this, is this person reaching out to me for me or are they reaching out to show that they care? Are they reaching out for me or are they reaching out for them? I've been dealing with like disappointment and like letting go of a lot of things that I've been trying to hold on to for the past two years of like holding on to people 
this is what this is going to be dramatic. <laughs> it's okay. So this, when it comes to like letting go, right, and disappointment, I think this is a common thing that people do. <laughs> but do you ever go like, oh, I wonder what my funeral will look like? Will people show up to my funeral? What will people do? Will people? How will they remember me? Right. But you're never going to see it. You're never going to see what people do. But when you get close to it, not necessarily like near death, right? Like personally. But when you get to a situation that's pretty fucking dramatic, right? Of being arrested, brutalized by a cop, and then sexually assaulted, it's pretty close to be like, who's going to come out of the woodwork? Who's going to show that they care? Who's this or that? And when nobody does, you have to let it go. And I've been trying to, I've been holding on to too much for too long. And over the past two weeks, I've had to let go of stuff. I've had to let go of people. I'm getting rid of a bunch of my stuff. Like I'm letting go of everything that I was before the 17th. And I think that is the healthiest thing that I've done. The isolation, not responding, not eating or sleeping too much. That stuff's bad. The letting go hurts, but it is the healthiest thing that I'm doing right now. I think trauma processing, I don't know. It feels, this time it does feel different. It feels um, like a processing of like a lifetime's worth of trauma. Like processing the shit that we've dealt with on the ground since last June. And then all of the other shit that's been swept under the rug since like day one. It's just processing all of that. That's what it's been like. That's, I just compare all of my trauma to how bad it could be. And they go, okay, it's not that bad. I'm still here. It's not that bad. But it is bad. (laughs) It's what we've dealt with is fucked up. Well, I think that's been another hard part about this is like centering myself without centering myself. Do you know what I mean? I've, I've tried very hard since day one not to center myself because I shouldn't. I'm a white woman. <laughs> Shut the fuck up and stand in the back, you know? Or if you're going to speak loudly, be amplifying. But with this, I'm like, if any time to speak loudly, this is the time. So that I think is invalidating myself by going like, don't center yourself. Because I shouldn't center myself. But then in these moments, I go... Let your voice be heard in this moment. Shut up for the next six months, but let your voice be heard on this one. It's, it's like my, my brain is just constantly fighting itself. I hope that this gives comrades like space to speak up. I hope people feel safer about speaking up. I feel like it it sucks when you're doing it. Like when you're being loud about it, when a lot of people aren't. But then hopefully that gets more people out about it. Like with this whole thing, I, I wonder, I'm like, how many people think that we deserved it because we were just there? We chose to be there. There is a certain, you take on risk, right? When you're on the ground, you take on a certain amount of risk. If I get shot, I know what I'm taking on. Doesn't make it right, but I know what I'm taking on. And I think that people think that means that you're accepting it as a form of violence, going like, yes, shoot me. Yes, brutalize me. Yes, sexually assault me. Because I know what I was in for because I came here. When that's not the case. So what did you expect? And then with this community, maybe I'm spiraling too much. I'm just going, I'm going off. <laughs> um, this community is anti-abuser or say it says they're anti-abuser, says they're anti-predator, says they're anti all of these things. Then our biggest enemy, sounds so dramatic, but it's true. Our biggest enemy, LAPD, does that to people, to comrades, to people's friends, right? And they still, there's nothing. LAPD, a comrade like made a post about it a few weeks ago. And it's like, why aren't we burning it down when LAPD does this? So if you're in the community, (laughs) you're listening to this part, step up. Even if you're friends with an abuser, you're affiliated with it. Get rid of your abuser friends, get rid of your fucking walk away and support people that need to be like, have their stories amplified. I don't know. I'm so sick of just watching just this being a part of our, our culture, sexual assault. 
that's what it feels like. It's just a part of the culture now. I think the majority of people don't realize how they're not as progressive or uh, supportive of sexual assault victims and like anti-sexual assault as they think they are. Even me at some points, I'm like, oh, maybe I need to like, if I know that this person's an abuser, I should be like going off on them and, you know, just wailing, right? Because in my head, that's what I want to do, right? And I understand people who are like, if they're triggered themselves and they can't speak up, I understand that. But the people who continuously support abusers or don't speak up about it, if you're not speaking up about it, you're supporting it. And that goes for LAPD. If someone's screaming about an abuser and you tell them, we'll talk, we'll get you someone later. We'll talk about it later. You're no better than those cops. So kill the cop and the abuser in your head. (laughs) Thank you for tuning in to episode two. Hidden Cases will be releasing new episodes every Friday. Subscribe on Spotify to never miss an episode. For more information, visit our website, hiddencasespodcast.com. If you have been affected by police sexual misconduct and you'd like to share your story, please email hiddencasesla at gmail.com. If you'd like to join the community, please join us on Instagram and Twitter at hidden underscore cases. Hidden Cases is written and produced by Strawberry Fields. Thanks for listening, and remember, we keep us safe.